Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all those who hate us. He has shown mercy to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies and can now serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And you, my little son, you will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how they can find salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercies, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us, giving light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. The passage from Luke chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 70, uh, 68 to 79, is a song called the Benedictus the song of Zechariah. It's the second of four songs that we find in Luke chapter one and two, songs that were inspired by the birth of Jesus. Songs that were poetic, they were profound, they were prophetic, these canticles. Last week we started our series looking at the first song, the Magnificat, that was originally came off the lips of a 14 year old girl. And this one, the Benedictus, came off the lips of a very old priest named Zechariah. Benedictus, why the name Benedictus? It's the first, in Latin, it's the first word of the first line of this prayer, this song, this psalm. Benedictus Dominus Deus Israel. Blessed be the Lord and God of Israel. Nowhere else in scripture do you find in such a concise area four songs outside of the book of Psalms, which was a song book, as you do in Luke chapter one and two. These songs, that just keep coming. In fact, there was a man named uh, Philip uh, Riken who said about these songs in Luke's, uh, Luke's chapters one and two, that they are the last of the Hebrew Psalms and the first of the Christian hymns. That they're this hinge point in all of between the Old and New Testament, between the singing of God and his faithfulness through the Old Testament and Jesus, the fulfillment of all things in the New. And so today, we'll look at this second song, the Benedictus. So good that you are here in the room, those of you joining us online and at our Skagit campus, thanks for being here with us. This is the second week of this series, Heaven and Nature Sing, that familiar line from Joy to the World, where all of heaven and nature in this celestial and terrestrial chorus praises that the Lord has come. And as I mentioned last week, our desire is not to just talk about heaven and nature singing, but that we would join in the chorus as well. And my specific desire is that this year during this Christmas season, we would take time to have hearts filled with worship and songs as we focus on Jesus throughout our week, not just for an hour on Sunday morning, but throughout our week. When I was thinking about that heaven and nature singing us joining it, I was thinking about that uh, great hymn of the faith that many of us grew up with, and I think it was the third verse of Great is Thy Faithfulness, <clears throat> where it says, summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. And then this line, Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. And that's what I long for us to do, to join with all nature, where all of creation, the rocks cry out, the heavens declare the glory, that we would join with all nature in manifold witness of God's faithfulness. And God shows his faithfulness in sending the Messiah and the birth of this child, Jesus. But if you read Luke chapter 1, you will know that it wasn't just the birth of a child. There were actually two births. There were two children. Now, last week in all of our services, I'm pretty sure in all of our services, I threw out this challenge in the last seven days. I challenged that you would read Luke chapter one for yourself. It's one of the longest chapters in the Bible, but I challenge you to read Luke chapter one. And I was gonna ask for a show of hands of how many actually did that, but my ego just cannot take that. 
to know that you didn't take my challenge. That's okay. The Bible says that God's word does not return to him void. Mine, however, trend that direction. But if you were to read Luke chapter one, and, and let me just throw out a challenge. In the next seven days, your phone will read it to you in eight minutes and 38 seconds. Checked it this morning. But if you were to read Luke chapter one, you will see that the Christmas narrative is not just about a birth, but there are two children who are born. And in some ways, their whole stories are parallel. Their birth narratives are very similar. The the boys, the two little boys, they're little boys and, and they're relatives and they're relatively the same age. They're six months apart. Both of their births had been prophesied not only by Isaiah, but Malachi, both of them show up in the prophecies of Isaiah and Malachi. Both of their births were announced by an angel, and in fact, it was the same angel. It was the angel Gabriel who had announced that they would be born. Both of these little boys were conceived in a way that was humanly impossible. It was divine, it was supernatural, the way that God had their conception. And when they're born, both of their their birth and their life bring this this cosmic seismic shift in the whole redemption story and salvation of the world. And in both births, they inspire songs. So similar, and yet the two individuals are as far apart as could possibly be. One of them far out uh, eclipses the other, and the other would say, and that's the way it must be. In fact, he would say, He must increase, and I must decrease. One was like the sun, and one was like the moon, both very important, but all things orbited around the sun. But today, we're going to look at the birth of this lesser being, the birth of John the Baptist. And when John was born, it was was very special. In fact, in Luke chapter 1, verse 66, it says about after he was born, everyone who heard this, wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. There was this sense of wonder. And again, if you read Luke 1 and 2, you see this idea of wonder comes up again and again. Mary wondered what kind of greeting was. The people wondered about this. They wondered this, this, this pondering of what is God up to? What is God doing? And these songs that come out of it, in the best sense of the term, are like a one-hit wonder. Not in a flash in the pan, you never hear the group again. But they sing one song, and it's this wonder of God's goodness, a wonder of God's faithfulness, a wonder of what is God fulfilling, what is God bringing about. And the interesting thing in these songs that we will look at throughout this series is that they come in the midst of a very dark, and if you'll allow me, silent night. For Israel, it was a dark, silent night. I mean, Isaiah had prophesied that there would be a Messiah, that he would redeem them, that he would rescue them. It had been 700 years since Isaiah had spoken those words. And then Malachi, again, reminds them of this coming Messiah and the one that would precede him. But Malachi was the last prophet. And for 400 years, there had not been another prophet. There had not been another angel. There had not been another word from God. It's like he went dark. It went silent. Did he forget? Is it ever going to happen? Is this wishful thinking? Have, has all hope been lost? Very, very silent night. And likewise, not on the national front of Israel, but for two of the characters in the story that we'll look at today, it was a very silent night for them. A couple named Zechariah and Elizabeth who had their greatest earthly desire that they had prayed for, that they had fasted for, they had asked God for. And year after year, decade after decade, they had asked and pleaded with God for this one desire. And all their prayers were met with silence from heaven to the point where they no longer prayed the prayer anymore because it was hopeless. And they experienced their own silent night. In fact, they experienced a lot of silent nights. 
nights of silence in their home where the silence was only broken by the muffled sobbing of yet again another monthly reminder of the disappointment that the prayer was not answered. The silent nights never interrupted by the cry of a newborn baby. The silent night never hearing the unintelligible cooing of a, of a toddler. The silent night of never hearing the pitter-patter of little feet. It was a silent night for them. And yet, in the midst of the silence, with Israel and with this couple, we see God's divine design and his sovereign orchestration. That even while it seemed like God was no longer listening, like he wasn't even aware that God was working behind the scenes, God was putting the pieces together, God was still working to bring about his plan. And maybe for some of you, that is all you need to hear today. That while it seems like God is distant, like he's forgotten, that maybe it's a reminder that God is still at work. And God has a plan. And God has not forgotten you. I think sometimes, I know I'm guilty of this, sometimes we want to get God to work in our story. And maybe God is saying, hey, you know what? I've got a grand narrative that I'm working with. Why don't you join me in that story? So today, I want, I want to look at this song, the second song in the series. And uh, as we did last week, I want to give you kind of the backstory, the story behind the song. In fact, there's going to be a lot of backstory because if you would have read Luke chapter 1, I wouldn't have to do what I'm doing today. So um, I'm going to give you some of the context of what's going on, some of the, build some of the characters that are in this, and then some of the events that led up to the song. So we're going to look at a lot of scripture out of Luke chapter 1. So shall we get into it? All right, let's do this. Luke chapter 1 verse 5, it says this, In the time of Herod, king of Judea. This is what I love about Luke. Remember Luke, the gospel writer, he was a doctor. Great attention to detail. He starts this and he says, in the time of of Herod, the king of Judea, that he doesn't say, well, once upon a time. What he makes really clear is this isn't legend. This isn't a myth. This isn't something, you know, kind of a fairy tale. This actually happened and it was a time in history when Herod was the king. Outside of the Bible, there is a lot of extra biblical sources that talk about Herod and his king, uh, his kingship and his kingdom. He says, it was during this time, Herod was often referred to as the king of the Jews, though he wasn't Jewish. So to kind of help, you know, assuage that whole difficulty, he married a woman named Miriam and uh, she was Jewish, one of 10 wives that he married, but that's beside the point. Herod was also referred to as Herod the Great. Now, the question was, did he give himself that name, which was very possible. It could have been a very narcissistic guy. And to say that Herod was great, great is a relative term, especially if you're his relative. But Herod did some incredible things. I mean, he was an incredible builder. I mean, the things that he built, the cities and the things that he would build for the community with theaters and racetracks and Caesarea Maritima, what he did there was the first time in human history that there was a man-made deep water port that was created. He he did that in his palace there, right on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, his summer palace. The problem is that he would build these things on the taxes of all the people in the country. And so there was a a heavy burden tax-wise, and he would build these palaces on Masada and down by the Dead Sea where he could go during the, in the winter where it was warmer and that's on this almost in, impenetrable tabletop mountain, this mesa where he builds this Masada or the Herodium where there once was not a mountain and today there is. He had that built. Even the, the temple, Herod's temple, he would do this for the Jews but they would have to pay for it. And the reality is while it was grand, it really had to do with him because he wanted his temple to be the best temple that was ever built, even though he had nothing to do with Yahweh. On top of that, Herod was, he was cruel, he was merciless, he was vicious, very jealous, threatened. And in fact, some people who would look back through history and the writings about Herod would come to this conclusion that Herod was probably a paranoid schizophrenic. He, he dealt with that. And whenever he felt threatened, he made sure to eliminate the threat 
even if it was family members, even his favorite wife, Miriam, he had her killed. Three of his sons, he was threatened by them. He had them killed. He had his brother-in-law killed. He had his mother-in-law killed. No, amen, sir. He, and that's really dark humor. I apologize. But Josephus said that he had 45 of the Sanhedrin killed. And as we know, for those of us who are familiar with the Christmas story, after Jesus was born, the king of the Jews, he had all the baby boys in the Bethlehem area that were two and under killed. He was a brutal, evil, cruel man. And this was the context And Luke says, at this time, when he was the king, and then he contrasts this evil, godless, narcissistic man with the other characters in our story. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest. Not a high priest, not a chief priest, just a priest. We'll talk about that in a minute. A priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, his wife Elizabeth, who also... Uh, was also a descendant of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth. As we've talked about many, many times, names in the Bible hold a great deal of importance. Zechariah means this, God remembers, which is really important when you think about the silent night of Israel and this couple. God remembers. And Elizabeth means God is my oath or God's promise. And now Elizabeth is from the line of Aaron, which was Aaron was the original priest. So Zechariah is a priest, and Elizabeth, her father would have been a priest, and her grandfather and her great grandfather she would have come from a long line of priests. So they're from that, and it goes on to say even more about this couple. Verse 6, both of them were upright, righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. I love that it says they were upright. They were righteous in the sight of God. Sometimes we are righteous in our own sight, aren't we? We know the things that we do. We're so self-righteous. And sometimes we work at being righteous in the sight of others. And it's possible to be righteous in your own sight and in the sight of others, but not in the sight of God. Not this couple. They were righteous in God's sight. And I'm guessing... There was some question of if, if we're righteous in God's sight, if we're doing everything that God has commanded us to do, if we're following all the regulations, and our names say that God remembers and that God's promise, then why is it that we never experienced the answer to prayer that we longed for? And it's laid out in this next verse, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, And they were both well along in years. This no doubt had been, as I said, decades of disappointments, frustration, questioning the goodness of God, questioning their own prayers, their own shame and maybe embarrassment in their culture, and maybe even the whispers of those in the culture, they must have some hidden sin. Why wouldn't God give them children? And yet, and yet they remained faithful to God. They remained faithful, not so that somehow if they did this, then God's obligated to do this, not in some way to to create this transaction where we were faithful and we were obedient, so you must answer our prayer. They were faithful to God because they revered God and they knew that he was holy and they knew that he he was God, and so they would follow him and serve him regardless of whether or not their prayers were ever answered. But they continue on. That's the context with Herod and with this couple. And here's the events that led up to this song, starting at verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God. Now let me just kind of give you a little backstory. By the way, there are so many rabbit trails in this, this passage that I am just going right past. But there's a few that I will take. Zechariah, he's, he's on duty with, with his division. This goes clear back to 1 Chronicles 24. Not important for you to look that up today. But Aaron was the original priest. He had these two sons, and then they had 24 divisions of priests. And for hundreds of years, this is the way it had been. Now, Zechariah is one of these divisions of Abijah. And with the 24 divisions of priests, there were 18,000 priests in Israel in this time. And these divisions were given duties in Jerusalem twice a year for one week. 
Then on some of the, the holiday festival years, the high holy days, uh, weeks, excuse me, they would all be there. So there's 24 divisions. Twice a year they go to Jerusalem, do the math, 48 weeks, and then there's these holy days. And they would go and they would serve at the temple, kind of like an, a, an army reserves, two weeks out of the year. So he has done this as an older man. He probably became a priest when he was around 20 and now the guess is he's in his 70s, maybe even 80s. So for 50 years, twice a year, he's used to going to Jerusalem to do his, his priestly duties with the others in his, uh, in his um, division. This is what they do every single year. But this, or every single time they go. This time was a little bit different. Something happened on this one. I mean, maybe he has done this a hundred times, gone to Jerusalem to serve as priest. But this time it's different. Verse 9, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. This is not something that happened all the time. With 18,000 priests, some priests would serve their entire lifetime and never be called for this. Their name would never get drawn. They would never go in the temple to burn the incense. We're not talking about the Holy of Holies. That was only the high priest. We're talking about into the holy place, the sanctuary, that they didn't just go waltzing in there. As this year, though, his name was pulled on this day. He gets to go into the sanctuary. It was probably a little bit frightening to go in there because while he goes in there, he's probably never been there before. And as he walks into this little chamber, there's the, the table of the showbread, and there's the, the golden lamp stand on this side, and then there's this altar with, where they would burn the, the incense, and right on the other side of that altar was this tapestry, this veil, this curtain, and behind that was the Ark of the Covenant, a frightening place to be, the closest he would ever be to the very presence of God, and frightening to go in there. And it said that the lot was cast his way, as was the custom of the priesthood. This wasn't just like, hey, get out the dice. Come on, lucky seven. Let's go. This is my turn. No, this is what they had always done because this is the way that God would reveal who he wanted to come in and to have the incense burned. So this time, his name gets pulled in the lottery. And he takes a coal from the, from the brazen altar and he takes it in there to burn the incense. And oh, there's so much to talk about that special incense that was only used in there, but we won't go into that. And he goes in to burn this all incense. And while he goes in, the incense representing the prayers of the people going up to God. Outside, all of the priests and the people that are in the temple, they would wait outside and they would be praying as he goes in single-handedly to represent them and their prayers going up to Yahweh. It was a profound, high privilege, scary responsibility. I don't know if you've ever been in a room, an office, a house where you thought you were the only one there and you were supposed to be the only one there, and you turn around and there's someone else there and it just startles you. Have you ever experienced that? It's just like, oh. He's the only one in there. He's the only one that's supposed to be in there. And I can imagine when he turns around and realizes there's someone else in there, he's already on edge to be in this. He's 70 some, 80 years old, going in to do this thing with his whole life he's hoped for, but now it's a frightening thing and there's someone there. What makes matters worse? It's an angel. I've never experienced that. But all of your ideas about these little precious moment angels are like, oh, touched by an angel. That is not a biblical angel. Because every time in the Bible an angel shows up, their first words are, don't be afraid. That gives you a hint. And it says that Zechariah is gripped with fear. Gripped with fear. He's already really close to the very presence of God. He's supposed to be in there alone. There's an angel there. And the angel responds to him. We'll jump to verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. This seems so random. And most of us, I think, when we read that, his prayer has been heard. His wife's going to give him a son. We put those things together. One scholar I read said, what if those were not connected? 
The reason he's in there is he's going in there to represent all of Israel, to pray that Israel would be redeemed, to pray for the coming of the Messiah. And what if the angel Gabriel says, listen, your prayer that you just prayed for the redemption of Israel, your prayer for the coming of the Messiah, that prayer has been answered. That would have been phenomenal. What what Zechariah is not even capable of understanding is there has been a 400 years of silence that is broken now in his presence. He's probably not even thinking how phenomenal this is. But all this longing for all these hundreds of years, that prayer has been answered. And it's almost as if Gabriel says, oh, and while I've got you, there's another prayer that you and your wife used to pray. I know you stopped decades ago, but you're going to have a son. And by the way, his name is going to be John. Some of us who've read this story are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you imagine how overwhelming this must have been for Zechariah? Well, what's even going on? He's never seen an angel before. Now he's talking about this, the fulfillment of the prophecies and, and a son. Are you kidding? How's this going to happen? And so the angel begins to tell him about this son that he's going to name John, which is not a name that they would have in their family. He's going to going to tell him a little bit about the son, and you can see how the angel just kind of eases in. Doesn't dump the whole load on him right at first. Just kind of eases in with him. And he says this, verse 14, he will be a joy and delight to you, just like for you. Let's just talk about you. Of course he will. I mean, he, he's going to be, the, he, he's gonna be the, the fruit of my loins, the bone of my bones, the flesh of my flesh. I'm, I'm going to be the, the blood father of a man cub. Yes, of course he'll be the joy. And he says, but it's not just you. And then he kind of goes another ring out. He says, and many, many will rejoice because of his birth. Yeah, I know my family, my friends, our our, our village. No, 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 many. And he says, and let's go even further. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Well, yeah, I'd hope that he would be a priest like me. And yeah, but what are we talking about here? And then he gives them some instructions. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink. And we could talk about the Nazarite vow and the duties of the priest, but we won't. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. As some of your translations will say he will be filled from the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. You remember last week, if you were here, when Mary came to see Elizabeth and he was starting to do his little uh, pronouncement, you know, the little backflip in the womb, that kind of deal. Holy Spirit inspired. So all of this information is given to Zechariah. This old man who's just trying to do his priestly duties. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man. I ain't as good as I once was. Not even sure if I'm good once as I used to be. I'm not as filled with virility like I was. I'm no spring chicken here. He's just like saying, I think, physically... Well, there's some things that just were from yesteryear for me. Take that with how you'd like. <laughs> Ask your doctor if Cialis is right for you. <laughs> he says, I am an old, an old man. And he goes, and my wife is, and I think he pauses. Because he's learned with wisdom. The only reason he's an old man is he's learned what not to say in these situations. <laughs> and my wife is... Well, along in years. So, how can I know? How can I be sure of this? Okay, let let me go one little rabbit trail here. A little spoiler alert. Because of these questions, he's kind of kind of put in timeout. He's kind of there's some consequences that come. Here's the question: If you're here last week, Mary is confronted by the same angel. She asks some questions, and she's called highly favored of God. Zechariah is confronted by the angel. He asks some questions, and he's kind of put in time out. He, he's going to have some consequences. We'll see that in just a minute. Why is it that Mary can ask questions about the impossible, but Zechariah can't? And I think it has to do with the nature of the question. Mary's question was, I don't know how this is going to happen. But I'm the Lord's servant, let it be. I don't know how this can happen. Zechariah's question was, I don't know if this will happen. I'm questioning 
you, Gabriel. I have doubts. In essence, it's not about even the possibility. I'm not even sure if you're telling the truth. So, he says, I am an old man. And Gabriel sees him and raises him one. 19, the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. <laughs> and let me tell you what that means. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. I mean, you see here, like, who are you to doubt Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, sent by God to give you this good news. And it's like Zachariah says, I need a sign. And it's as if Gabriel's saying, I am the sign. You think about this. Again, give me a little bit of grace in here. I can almost see Gabriel saying, dude, you've been coming here twice a year for 50 years. Never once has your name been drawn to come in here and burn incense. And of all the guys who've done this for the last 50 years, have you ever heard of one of them experiencing an angel here? No, you have not, because it's never happened before. And on the week that you happen to be here, on this day, your name happens to be drawn out by Lot, which we believe, you know, is that God's way of revealing. And you come in here to do your duties, and I am here, an angel in your presence, talking to you, telling you that the fulfillment of all of the prophecies is happening, and the prayers that you quit praying 20 years ago is going to happen. You're going to have a son. You need a sign? Okay. You want a sign? I'll give you a sign. Verse 20. Here's your sign. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true in their proper time. You want a sign? There's your sign. And if you read through, it implies not only can he not speak, it implies later that he can't hear either. That everything goes quiet around him. You want a sign? You're going to have to learn sign language. There's your sign. Speaking of sign language, did you read where D.K. Metcalf, we'll pray for the, the Hawks, D.K. Metcalf learned sign language so that he could trash talk without getting flagged for it? Brilliant. Brilliant. Now, if you guys start signing here, this is not so brilliant. You're going too long, Pastor. Okay. When asked about it, he said, yeah, there's that. But part of it, I just wanted to learn sign language. I wanted to learn ASL. Zachariah doesn't want to learn sign language, but he has to. The ending of Israel's 400 years of silence is the beginning of Zechariah's silence. And now he finishes up. I'll have to fast forward. You can read this on your own in Luke 1 if you would like. He finishes his duties. He goes back home. You can imagine him trying to communicate to Elizabeth. And for nine months, he's isolated in this quiet, self-enclosed situation. What does he think about? He can't hear. He can't talk. But his mind, maybe he thinks about, this is the craziest thing. I'm going to have a son. I'm going to be a dad. Look at me at my age. It's going to be so crazy. I'll go to the store and I'll buy Pampers and Depends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get Similac and Insure. <laughs> We're going to be fighting over the Gerbers. Who gets what? He's going to get his first tooth when I lose my last. <laughs> Maybe he looks over at his wife. Well along in years. But she's glowing like he's never seen before. And that little baby bump. And then she begins showing. Maybe he thinks back to those words that the angel had said to him about how this son of his would, would be great in the eyes of the Lord. And maybe as a priest, he begins thinking back through all of the prophecies and that your prayer has been heard, the prayer for the redemption of Israel and for the coming of the Messiah. And could that be? And 
and all the prophecies in Isaiah that not only speak of the coming Messiah, but the one that would come before him. And the prophecies of Malachi, not just of the coming Messiah, but the one who would come before him. And that's his son, John. John, this name that means God is gracious. And, and that whole thing when Mary showed up two-thirds of the way through the pregnancy, and I can't hear a word they were saying, but they were touching each other. So it's just, it's all of that. And for nine months, he wonders What is God up to? God, what are you doing? Is this what the scriptures mean? Is this happening in our very midst? And then the baby is born. And he still hears nothing. And he's still not able to speak. Eight days later, fast forward, eight days later. Verse 59. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, as was the custom. And they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. Of course, that's what Zechariah would want. That's what every father would want in this day and age, especially especially as someone who's in his 70s or 80s. It finally has a firstborn son. Why not give him my name to carry on the family name? I'm going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. Wait, wait, what? John? No one in your family is named John. Why would you name him John? No one does that. And they try to communicate. This is where you see there. They're trying to make signs, trying to communicate to Zechariah. Then in in, uh, verse 63, he, that's Zechariah, he asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. See, Zechariah knew what happened the last time he questioned what the angel said, and there's not a chance he's going to do that again. And just as the angel said his name will be John, and just as the angel said that he would be silent until that happened... Right on cue, verse 64. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak, praising God. There's so much he wants to say, so much he could say, so much he'd like to talk to Elizabeth about, so much they weren't able to communicate through the whole pregnancy, so much what happened in the temple, so much about the angel. He wanted to talk about all that, but he's praising God. His first response is worship. After nine months of silence, after nine months of thinking about it, of pondering the scriptures and wondering what God is up to and praying and and meditating all this, he just worships. And in this point, he is filled with the Holy Spirit and now he writes his song and I have less than five minutes to talk about it. Wow, did I go longer this morning. Okay, you're really just going to probably need to read this on your own. um, So he writes his song. Um, We're just going to have to fly through this stuff. Okay, can you listen and fast forward? Okay, so he writes this song. He writes this, Benedictus Dominus Deus Israel. Blessed be the Lord and God of Israel. That's his first line. Verse 68, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. This is the theme of his entire song. He has come. He has come. Just as he promised, he has come. We sang that song O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. There was a song I grew up singing. I haven't sung it in years. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art. And then my favorite line in the whole song was this. "Dear, Dear desire of every nation. You know why that was my favorite line? Not because of the lyrics, but because of the tune. Dear desire of every, this part, nation. Ah, that was just fun to sing. But this desire, this deep desire of every nation, Isaiah would say in Isaiah 64, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. They had been longing for this. God, oh, crack the sky, come visit us. Come fulfill the prophecies. Later, or earlier in Isaiah chapter 7, this familiar prophecy, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He has come. Jesus would say, or it would be said about Jesus in, in, in John 1, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He has come. He has come. And then, in the next part of let down towards the end of this song that he writes, 
I, I think of that, that scene from Lion King when Simba is born and Rafiki, the little monkey, goes out on Pride Rock and all the animals around and he holds him up. You know the scene? And all the animals are going crazy. That, that's how I see this next, where he says in Luke chapter 1, verse 76, and you, my son, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. These aren't just words that he's made up. These are the prophecies he's thought about for nine months. Malachi, that last prophet, before everything went quiet, in Malachi chapter 4, right at the end, says, and the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And he's calling back to that prophecy. You know, hail the heaven-born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Thinking of the darkness that would be broken by this new day. Thinking of the words of Isaiah in chapter 8. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And they will be thrust into utter darkness. Such despair. And yet, two verses later, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So back to Zach. He ends the song this way, because of the tender mercies of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, that this one would come and his son would go before him and prepare the way for the one, and he brings light into our darkness and life to our death. In John chapter 1 such a beautiful parallel to this whole thing where it says that John was not the light. He came pointing, proclaiming that there would be light, the true light that was coming into the world. It would be Jesus. It wasn't John. Zechariah even knows that. There's one far greater than my son. In John 1 verse 4, it says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Um, uh, Luke 1 79 and let's let's stop that'll be our last verse here to shine on those living in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace to guide our feet into the path of peace see this picture of what would come the fulfillment is what we experience and as a church, it's what drives us. It's what motivates us. Just like Isaiah did. Just like Malachi did. Just like Zechariah did. Just like John did. It's to point people to Jesus. The one that will bring hope in despair. The one that will bring light in darkness. The one that will bring life in the midst of our death. To help people to find and follow Jesus. That's what we're about. That's what we long for every single one of us, that we would just continue to walk in the light and in the path of peace that Jesus brings. So here, here's what I want to do. Beside the Luke chapter 1 challenge, here's what I would love to challenge you to do. Zechariah was quiet for nine months. You can imagine Elizabeth was praising the Lord. But that would be uh, like such a torture. N nine weeks would be difficult. Nine days would be, nine hours would be hard. But here's what I want to challenge you to do. In striving to join with all nature in manifold witness, would you intentionally, and it will take intentionality, I guarantee you that, carve out nine minutes each day this week? Nine minutes away from all the frenetic activity, all the duties, all the hustle, all the stuff you're saying. Nine minutes and be quiet 
It may mean getting up nine minutes earlier than normal. It may mean going to bed nine minutes later. It may mean taking your time in your commute or going to your car or in the closet or in the bathroom, but nine minutes, and I know with a house full, it may be very, very difficult, but it is possible to find nine minutes each day to refocus, to think through what God has done, to think of what he's doing, and like Zechariah, to respond in this season to just worship our God and his goodness to us. Now, there is so much more, but we are done. <laughs>